Welcome to this video on migration, homing, and navigation. We're going to cover each of these three things one by one, starting off with migration. So migration, you need to know, is a regular movement of a population of animals between two different habitats. So this happens regularly. Now, most common, it happens every year, but sometimes can happen once in a lifetime. Now, lots of populations of animals do it, and the reason they do is usually because reproduction occurs in one habitat, so one environment, and then there's environmental extremes they want to avoid in the other, like it gets really cold or there's not much food there. So while regular migration for most species means every single year, for some species this can be once in a lifetime and it usually happens just before they reproduce. So for example, salmon return to freshwater to reproduce only once in their lifetime. Same with eels, they migrate to deep marine trenches down at the bottom of the ocean and reproduce only once in their lifetime as well. So this regular movement of a population of animals is different from, say, you going to McDonald's, and it looks different in the picture, but we need seven different factors to articulate why us regularly moving to McDonald's and back with our friends is different from a whole lot of elephants trekking across Africa. So there are seven factors we need to know. We're going to go through them one by one, and that'll take us through the whole understanding of migration. So the first one is you must have a return journey. So for example, here we've got this Beijing Swift. It goes from Beijing up in China all the way down to the bottom of Africa and back again. It takes about nine months, so it's almost a year before it actually gets back home again. But the key point is that it does get back home. So all migration involves a return journey. Secondly, it involves a purpose. So a favorable environment that they want to go to, it can be to reproduce. It could be to make use of some new food source. So they've got scarce food in one area, they want to go find a whole lot more food in a new area. Or it could be just to avoid a bad climate, say during the winter time it gets cold or wet, or some other climatic factor, which makes it not a very nice place to be. The third factor we're looking at is you have to be active. So active means you're actually expending energy as you go along. So you can't just wander along and go in your car. That's not migration. You can't be carried by winds or currents. You have to do the work when you're migrating. So you have to fly or walk or run or swim. So that's the active part of migration. Four is it has to be across long distances. So we learned about the Beijing Swift, which travels all the way from up on the right-hand side of China, the east coast, all the way down to the bottom of Africa, thousands and thousands and thousands of miles. It's not going down the road to Maccas. And number five, it involves whole populations. So it's not just one bird or two birds or a family of birds that decides to fly to a new place. The whole population of birds, say, would go all the way down to different countries or different environments. Next, it's a genetically controlled thing. That means if you've got a bird or a butterfly or something which migrates, it's instinctive. So you could put it by itself and it would still have that innate, instinctive, genetic urge to go and migrate and travel to a new place when it came winter or spring or summer or whatever season they were going to migrate in. So it's genetically controlled. Finally, it's initiated by some environmental factors. So if the day gets too short, it could trigger that innate need to start to migrate. It could also be changes in temperature, so say it starts to get colder, or a lack of food. But something's going to initiate that migration. So think of this like the trigger, and once that trigger is set, then that innate need to migrate kicks in, and they fly across vast lands to find new places, based on these seven different factors. So while you should learn all seven, you need to make sure for sure that you understand the purpose of why they migrate, and that's about reproducing, about food and changing climate, and the fact that it's actually initiated by environmental factors. They're the two most important ones that you take home. The second of three things we're going to look at is homing. So homing is the ability of some kind of animal to find its way home, even when it's unfamiliar territory that it's never been in before. So think of it, if you wanted to fly from Auckland to Fiji in your own little plane, you go along in the plane and the wind starts to blow you off course, so you get pushed sideways, sideways, sideways. You're going to need to learn to turn all the way towards Fiji so that you end up in your destination. Even though you're no longer flying straight, you're allowing yourself to adjust to still get home safe. So this happens all the times with animals, it's not just planes. So things like storms, or need to find food and go off course, or find a mate, there's a whole lot of reasons why an animal might go off course, but it needs the ability to find its way home, and that's called homing. The final thing we're going to look at is navigation. So navigation is the use of some kind of cues to orientate yourself, or some external cues to navigate your way somewhere. So different things could include like sun or star compasses. So you look at the sun or the stars in the sky and kind of roughly work out where you are. Could be landmarks so you can see common features which you know what to do. A lot of animals use the Earth's magnetic field to do it. And some animals use their scent. 
So we're going to cover the five different factors of navigation, the ways in which animals navigate themselves through familiar and unfamiliar territories. So the first one is the sun compass. So the sun's position in the sky changes around on the time of day. And so some animals have this instinctive ability to look at the sun to know what the time of day is and then to work out roughly where they're going based on its position in the sky. So birds use this a lot of the time and that helps show them where to go. Now, actually, young birds also use star compasses. So stars form this complex pattern in the sky, and obviously stars don't move that much relative to each other, although they change around from the time of year. But young birds learn the pattern of stars and imprint it on their brains, and then at nighttime they can use that to navigate themselves. The next thing we want to look at is magnetic compasses. So the Earth has this big magnetic field around it. It is like a big magnet. And so many organisms have these crystals in their head which help them actually navigate. So bees have it. Whales have it, even pigeons have it, and these crystals are magnetic, they're a lot like rust actually. And those crystals line themselves up with the Earth's magnetic field, and that tells the animal which way to point themselves in respect to that Earth's magnetic field. If you know where the Earth's magnetic field is, it's like having a compass inside your brain so you can point yourself in the right direction. Next is visual signs and landmarks, now people use these all the time. Turn right at that shop with the big red sign round on the corner. That's a visual landmark. So these require learning before they can be used. For example, you get digger wasps, so they'll go out of their nest and they'll fly around and get familiar with their environment before they bother to go out and properly look for prey. Or you get birds. They're less likely to get lost on their second migration, and that's because the first time they go, they're learning common landmarks that they can see. So the second time they spot the same landmarks, they know they're going in the right direction. Less likely to get thrown off. The fifth thing we look at is scent trails. So for example, dogs can find rabbits. That's an example of them following the rabbit's scent. Or ants lay down a trail as they go exploring. That's either so that they can run back to their nest and not get lost, or if they find something good, it allows other ants to follow alongside them. Also, salmon use their memory of smell to go back to their native, which is where they were born, stream. So this is when they return to breed once in their lifetime. So these are the five different environmental cues of which animals can use to navigate themselves. So that's what you need to remember for the navigation part of things. So here's what you need to know as a summary. The first is we learned that migration was this regular movement of a population of animals between two different habitats. We learned there are seven different factors which you should memorize. And, and the most important of those to mention in your answer is the purpose of why people navigate, which is to do with climate change, mating, and food. And the second is the fact that it's initiated by environmental factors, because that ties into other aspects we learn about in biology, so it allows you to link all of your answers together. The second thing we learned was about homing, and homing is the ability of an animal to find its way home over unfamiliar territory. And we learned there's a whole lot of reasons why people might get lost, whether it's storms or finding a mate or finding food. Either way, you need the ability to home or the homing ability to get your way home again. Lastly, we learned about navigation, and this is the use of environmental cues to orientate yourself and navigate yourself. We learned five different navigation tools that animals use. It was the sun and star compass, so you can look at the sky and see where you are. And we learned that some animals actually have magnetic crystals inside them, so they can use the magnetic field of the earth like a compass. Then we learned about visual signs and landmarks, which places can use. And remember, this only works once you're familiar with the territory. And finally, we learned about scent trails to navigate yourself. So this is what you need to know for migration, homing, and navigation. Let's look at a question now. So here we've got in Cape Canapas on the coast of the Hawke's Bay is an exposed headland. So it hosts the largest mainland gannet population in New Zealand with around 6,500 breeding pairs which arrive in August every year. So the birds that come remain there until those young fledglings, their little chicks, are mature enough to leave the nest and then they return to Australia in March the following year. So what we need to do is identify two behaviors displayed by the gametes and explain these behaviors. So two behaviors is the important part. You can't just do one. So we're going to choose migration and navigation because we have a lot to talk about on these topics. So we'll start with migration and we're going to both identify and describe this behavior and explain it in more detail before going on to navigation. So let's think what we know about migration. It's the seven different factors. So if we want to apply these seven different factors to the gannet population that's on Cape Kidnappers, we can say things like the gannets migrate each year for breeding. It says they come every single year before they return to March. So that ticks all the factors of migration. It's a long trip, it's purposeful, it's active, involves populations, genetically controlled, and initiated by environmental factors. So to explain this more, we can say it's driven by breeding. That's the purpose of what they're wanting to do. 
but it can also have benefits of climate and food. So in the second part, we've identified the most important one, which is the purpose of migration. So you always want to say this, even if you can't remember anything else. The next thing is about the other factors of migration. So we could say, this is where the birds travel long distances in a return journey every single year. And during that trip, the birds are active and whole populations travel together. So in this written answer, we've discussed all of the different factors of migration to show that we have a really deep understanding. Now let's look at navigation. So we know five different ways to navigate. So if we want to write this, we can say the Gannets must have had a way of navigating. So they might have used magnetic compasses or magnetic navigation or stellar and solar navigation, so it's the sun and the star compasses. Or they might have used visual landmarks to ensure they do it. Now, it's unlikely that they would have used scent trails flying through the sky. There's not many scents which are laid down there. So it's not that common in birds to use that one there. So once we put all that together, we have our final answer. And this is how you do migration, homing, and navigation questions.